Yeah, I mean, I'm biased, but he's very creative. Why be biased? He just admitted he's biased. It's biased, unethical, and unfair. We are so biased, and our bias just drowns our ability to apply any kind of reason or logic, then we easily get offended and we have to pridefully defend stupid positions and stuff like that. AI just a million times better. Let me just say something on that because I'd like to clarify my position. So like Bernardo, I'm suspicious of the notion, skeptical of the notion that AI will become self-aware in the same way that we are. But that doesn't mean it's not going to be incredibly powerful and change the nature of reality. I think it will. On top of that, there's an additional question that people often don't bring in, which is, could an outside intelligence leverage AI to actually impact our reality? I think, I mean, I know people that are deeply in AI, some of the CEOs of companies who are also into this field, who've seen some evidence of that. We're welcoming Darren King to Skeptico. So I am so genuinely excited about this. And I came across you, we were just chatting one second ago about Bernardo, who I have a ton of respect for. I really like him. And I, I don't know what it's like to try and, you know, engage with the level of mainstream people that he does and kind of carry the torch for this other point of view. So I, I appreciate that. At the same time, you gotta, you gotta do your thing, man. So but that's how I found you. And then I, I was like, I was telling my wife, I was like, oh my God, this is, this guy is like exactly the stuff I want to talk about in terms of point of convergence. You've kind of looked at what I've said and you tell me where, where we might start, where we might go. Well, the first thing I thought was interesting was how you mentioned, and I've seen this before as well with Bernardo. Um, on the one hand, I, like you, have a lot of respect for him, and I really appreciate him championing in mainstream philosophical circles the perspective he has of idealism. And I think he's doing that job better than anybody else in the world and does it in a unique way. Um, but at the same time, I think he may be constricted by feeling like he has to move in those circles and to some degree play by the rules of those circles. Um, so that maybe either makes him play it safe in terms of what he says. So he just sticks to what he can sort of argue for uh, in a philosophical argument. But then he, like you pointed out in the email you sent to me, tends to be cautious about NDE research, for instance. And I think NDE research, along with, you know, these converging fields, right? That's what I find most fascinating, I guess, as a start off here for our conversation is that it's not just one field. It's not just one thinker. It's converging fields of evidence, all pointing in the same direction. And as Bernardo does a good job of pointing out in, in my conversation with him, he made this point, idealism has been the dominant paradigm for much of the world, for much of our history. And we're really in this anomaly right now uh, with Westernism and the way that we have adopted physicalism. And it's a fairly recent um, notion, and he's pretty convinced that we're quickly moving away from it. So in that sense, uh, I'm, I think that's promising. And again, what's most compelling for me, which is why I called my podcast Point of Convergence, is because that's what's happening. It's convergence of all these different fields of data pointing the same directions. Yeah. I mean, I think you know, launching kind of one step further, because even the Point of Convergence thing, I get uh, multiple lines of evidence, fantastic, and you can beat physicalists over the head with that. But I like kind of taking the leap and saying, okay, that's really kind of a dead-end discussion. And that's what I was really pointing out in my discussion with Bernardo and my discussion with uh, Christoph, because that was really the impetus for the conversation with Bernardo. It's like, here's Christoph Koch, Christoph is great. I interviewed him 10 years ago and he always has kind of played this kind of middle ground. Like a lot of these NDE researchers do this thing too, you know, hey, but analogically, this is what we see, but who knows? Just there's a certain insincerity about it or untruthfulness about it that I think keeps us stuck right where we're at. And the point that I made with Bernardo about the interview with Christoph is Christoph Koch you know, go listen to Lex Friedman with his multi-million views and his interview with all these guys. And it's just so drooling over, oh my God, Christoph, you've done so much in this night. Hey, Christoph's a great guy. I don't have anything against him. But like I pointed out, you can't butcher the near-death experience data the way that he does and write a book about it. You can't say, I've investigated the near-death experience research. I've included it into my book and get it as wrong as he gets it. I mean, it's as wrong as Michael Shermer gets it. And then Bernardo doubles down and says the same thing. 
Well, I don't think Pin Von Lommel really says that. No, the exact opposite. Pin Von Lommel says you guys are consistently getting it wrong and you're misrepresenting what I'm saying. And that's not it. The evidence is completely outside the realm of the physicalist paradigm that you want to continue to prop up. And so that's what I kind of see that you're kind of way past that, but you're willing to at least kind of look at the whole playing field and say, okay, phenomenology, that is experiences matter, is something that we can corral a little bit. It doesn't have to be all anecdotal and it doesn't all have to be jammed back into a physicalist model. We can somehow use that. And I feel so strongly uh, about that as well. So let's talk about that for a minute. Yeah. I mean, I think when one looks at, on the face of it, the preponderance of the NDE research, uh, it's it's overwhelming. And to try to fit that within a physicalist paradigm takes many more leaps in logic than just sort of looking at it in the face of it and recognizing these are representing real experiences. And if it's the case that consciousness is an epiphenomenon of brain processes and the brain is not showing any neurochemical function at the time, then something's not adding up. And when you, again, look at some of these other fields of research, even look at some non-dual traditions, this is kind of what they point to. So it is strange to me as well. I mean, I understand that science is conservative. It moves slowly. You know, I've read my Thomas Kuhn. I understand how scientific revolutions happen. But this denial of the evidence doesn't seem at all objective to me. So I'm completely on the same page with you there. And I think one thing I'm able to do, unlike maybe the fields that Bernardo is in and the pools that he swims in, is I don't have to play it safe, right? I basically will just say what I feel like the evidence is pointing towards, and I don't have to defend it within the academy. Uh, so I don't have to worry about colleagues that might be suspicious. I run into academics all the time, not just with the NDE research, but even with the UFO phenomenon research who have to play it safe. I see it over and over again so they can get some traction with their colleagues. But in so doing, they're kind of butchering the data a little bit. So it's kind of a catch-22. And I'm just happy to be in a field where I don't have to worry about those things. Yeah, great. And well, and I guess that's kind of my point. You know, I teed you up at the beginning. I said, this is inquiry to perpetuate doubt. That's what I'm about. And in particular, I'm about that because of people like you who are now brave enough to step in that next realm. And I'm going to say, I want to kind of push back right away and say, no, Darren, you do have to be held to that same standard. You are accountable in that same way. And by you holding yourself accountable, which you do, I think, then that exposes how they are not holding themselves accountable. And like one of my things lately has been AI is a boon in this. And anyone who doesn't see that just hasn't used the technology enough. And I'm very familiar with the technology. But Bernardo makes that same mistake. You know, he goes, hey, AI... You know, you're really not going to get much with AI. Well, AI just kind of wiped the floor with your argument right there, you know, all over, done. Yeah, no, I agree. And to respond to what you said at the beginning there, I agree about being held to the same standard. What I'm saying is I don't have to play it safe. So they have to practice real politic to some degree within the circles that they're in, which makes them, I think, not be as honest about what the data is actually pointing towards. So in my case, I do actually try to follow the data wherever it kind of thing. And following in the lead of people like John Mack, who tried to do the same thing, even though he was heavily criticized for it. Um, yeah, I think that it's interesting with AI, what you described there, because I was listening to, again, that interview you did with Bernardo, when you do the dialogue back and forth with the AI. It's interesting to me how people think that it's doing this deep level reasoning, because often it'll do even not even a super great job of regurgitating what you said. It can pick up English words and regurgitate them back to you. But it's perplexing to me, and I think shows where there's some sort of gap in it, where you ask an initial question, it gives you this sort of standard conventional answer. And then only when you stop it and ask it to reason about what it just said, then it recognizes something, which I guess raises interesting questions about how it's generating responses. But I'm also pretty familiar with the technology, and I also have a background in programming like you and like Bernardo. So I've seen how much, to the point that you made in that interview, how much the life of a programmer has completely changed in the space of two years. I was working on some programming for a project I'm doing with the Archives of the Impossible at Rice University. And how I go about writing functions is completely different than it was a year and a half ago, right? So the dizzying pace of change is remarkable. And I'll also make this point that to agree with you and take it one step further, 
I think a reason why we do have to knock down some walls and be more directive about this is that we don't necessarily have the time as a civilization to wait 20 years for physicalism to sort of die a slow death kind of thing. Like I have real concerns about the trajectory we're on. And I think reinvigorating people's sense of life and purpose, I think is something we need as a civilization to get past this kind of turn we're up against. In that sense, I completely agree with you. And it's perplexing how slow it goes. And it's perplexing to me that people like Bernardo will sort of play the game when he could actually take the front foot more. So as an example, even when he came up with that Silurian hypothesis to explain the UFO phenomenon, I was perplexed by that because I'm thinking, so Bernardo's an idealist. He could come up with some really novel notions of what these things could be, especially because with the data I'm really familiar with, the notion of like what frame of reality or what dimension of reality or you know what state of consciousness this is actually happening within is one of the open-ended questions. And a model like idealism presents many more alternatives that are interesting we could explore. So if for him to sort of double down in a physicalist-based kind of perspective, was strange to me. And the same thing with the NDE research. I don't understand why he's hesitant there. And on top of that, when I spoke with him, he expressed real hesitance around some of the abduction stories and some of the narratives of experiencers and dismissed them as quote unquote silly, which to me, again, I love Bernardo, I love the work he's doing, but that didn't seem like he was making that statement after having done as much rigorous research there as he has done in other areas, which was again, perplexing. Uh, yeah, so there's so many points to dive into, and I'm not going to apologize for kind of jumping into the middle of this. We should back up probably, and even though we gave people a little bit of an introduction, um, the John Mack uh, Foundation, which you are the director of communications for. Oh, boy. I mean, we could talk for an hour about that history. Give people who kind of maybe have forgotten or are too, too young to remember thumbnail sketch. And then how do you enter that picture? And what is your connection to that phenomenon, which you have direct personal connection to it, but you also kind of hold that apart, I think, from, you know, you're not one who leads with that. Well, my experience, you know, back in, right. know, that's what it's all about. Kind of thing. So I don't know, a lot right. there. Yeah, a lot there. So let's start with John Mack. So, um, John Mack was a really highly regarded, highly respected uh, psychiatrist at Harvard um, and had uh, won the Pulitzer Prize uh, for a book that he wrote um, and was regarded, you know, highly by his colleagues and in his field. And then one day, Bud Hopkins, uh, who he knew in passing, um, while John, I think, was in New York one day, uh, called him up and said, hey, would you like to meet some people who've had encounters with aliens? And John said, what? Had encounters with who? And Bud Hopkins said, no, it's real. Like, you want to come check this out? And John, again, to his credit, was driven by curiosity, not by agendas, right? Not by conventional thinking. And so he went and he listened. And of course, what John brought to the table that was so important historically was that his entire role was about determining whether or not people were being truthful to the best of their ability, whether or not they were delusional, whether or not they were suffering from some sort of psychopathology. So he's employing all of those filters as he's listening to his people, but with an open heart, you know, honestly wanting to hear their experience, very much like a, uh, a warm human talking to another human. And as he listened to more and more of these accounts, he was struck by how similar they were, especially back in a day where these were not widely published. So it's awfully uncanny how similar the accounts are in terms of different elements of the experiences. And he also found that they were by and large, healthy individuals, psychologically healthy, not suffering from delusion and not trying to uh, win fame or fortune, actually wanting to have sometimes even a psychiatrist say, I think you are going crazy because they would rather believe that than that alien beings are abducting them onto spaceships. So he became a chief figure back in the 90s in working with these experiencers and championing their cause and coming out into the mainstream, which was highly skeptical. Because again, as a modern society, how would we not know this? How are we not seeing them land on the White House lawn? Why don't we have better quality videos and photos and all these arguments that people make? Again, with all sorts of hubris, realizing or not realizing how much further ahead they are than us and how they can work with our consciousness, by the way, in addition to being able to manipulate space-time itself, apparently. 
But he became a chief champion of saying something is going on here. And he also, again, to his critics said, this challenges my worldview. I have no place for this in my present worldview, right? He was a conventional thinker, right? And and he was willing to have that worldview challenged by the data, which is all we're asking for. There's layers to the story, which you might know better than I do, and I'd love to hear, but I find intriguing. Mm -hmm. One is that he is like a, a social elite in New York. So when he goes to this party with this artist, Bud Hopkins, and I could just imagine the scene, you know, this cocktail party, and Bud Hopkins starts throwing around how he does hypnotic regression with these people, and they tell him the stories. You can just see where this, you know, leading psychologist, psychiatrist, you know, say, wait a minute, you're an artist. You're doing hypnotic progression. You don't know what you're doing, pal. And he goes, no, this is real. I know enough. Come on over and do it. And I think it connects to this interesting thing because Bud Hopkins eventually teams up with David Jacobs. And we'll talk about David Jacobs in a minute. But one of the slams that people who are not, not, wanting to engage with the data is that, oh, it's hypnotic regression there. It's all throw it all out the window. But Hopkins wasn't that bad. David Jacobs wasn't that bad. And John Mack spotted that. John Mack did hypnotic regression and he was very successful with it, with his patients. So this notion that we need to throw it out, it's like his, I, what I imagine is that what he wanted to see is that, is he really doing it in a, in a way that's going to get us the most information, accurate information. Absolutely. So a couple of points there. So first of all, let me cover the hypnosis part because I'm with you that we actually do have to welcome it, even though we do have to um, hold a high standard for how it's done. And you do have to be very aware of leading questions, for instance. And there are some researchers who I think have a conflict of interest because they have a hypothesis and then they're the ones regressing people. And even if they don't consciously end up doing it, they sometimes might subtly, uh, subconsciously lead it in a certain direction. So I think we have to set up sort of boundaries there to make sure we're being objective. So again, to John's credit, he had a second psychiatrist unconnected from him, unconnected from this material, basically do an evaluation of each of these people to see what his objective third party, uh, you know, sense was of them. And he said, they seem like normal people, they're healthy people. And so that was, again, John not trying to trust just his own perspective. Um, now on the part about, you know, the way that John impacted culture and whatnot and the spirituality piece, absolutely. And towards the end of his life, John was really interested in survival after death, by the way, and was focused on that kind of material. And he was actually encouraged when he actually read the material and he talked to different people and he ran into people with indigenous backgrounds, right? Or shamanic understanding. And they said to him, you need to go talk to indigenous cultures. You need to go talk to shamans because this is not um, divided up. This Cartesian split doesn't exist in those cultures, right? So he went and talked to these people and they kind of laughed and said, yeah, you white people, you think this is so weird and you don't know how to you know, metabolize this. But for us, it's always been part of it. And then John would ask a question like a good physicalist, like, okay, but are these happening in reality or is it happening kind of in a dream world? And they'll say, to us, there is no difference. Like that that's more of a spectrum of conscious experience. And, you know, he actually went to Africa and interviewed different tribes that had a different word even for the greys going back well into their history kind of thing. So he recognized that something was going on here. Now, I will say that he still wrestled and he actually ended up having a conversation with Thomas Kuhn. They were childhood friends, actually. They grew up together. And he had a conversation like, how do I, how do I represent this in the mainstream? Because if I say it's fully real, physically real, it's going to challenge a lot of people and they'll just want to, you know, just say, there's no way, there's not enough evidence. At the same time, it wasn't really playing according to the rules of being in kind of third realm kind of thing, which is kind of what the humanities like to talk about. So I think even for John, he kind of slid a bit towards, um, let's say it's quasi-physical, right? And I and my colleagues and friends have talked about, it would be very interesting to hear what John Mack would say today hearing notions from people like David Grush that we have bodies and we have craft and hangers from craft retrievals. That fully puts it in physical reality, even if it is more complicated than that. So then I guess let's segue into how did you become associated with the John Mack Association? And then obviously it connects to some experiences that you've had. So the experiences I've had, first of all, this is 
really fascinating. And again, depending on how familiar people are with this lore and this topic, they'll find this harder to believe than others. Just depends on how much familiarity you have. Because one of the uncanny things that happens is over time, you, your fascination with the topic, my fascination with the topic, sometimes gets to the point where it prompts certain questions around, am I being, is something being inserted into my consciousness that was the seed of my interest going back a long, long time? So for instance, even when I was in high school, I remember reading all of Whitley Struber's books. I was totally fascinated. There was a time we went up to a mountain cabin and the wind blew the door open and everybody started screaming. It was pandemonium. Um, people's worst case scenario kind of came to the fore. And we afterwards kind of laughing said what each of us thought it was. You know, one person thinks ax murder, somebody thinks a bear, somebody thinks a cougar. I think gray aliens, right? That was my answer. So I had a really specific interest in this topic alone, like abduction research. Little did I know that decades in the future, I would end up working with the John Mack Institute. And then for a while, it kind of like diminished and went into the background. And then I had an experience in 2005 with my young family. We were traveling across the country and we woke in the early morning hours. I'll just give you the quick version here. And there was a female entity at the end of our bed. And at the time, my wife was multiple months pregnant with our son and our daughter was in the bed beside us. And I got out of bed to start walking towards this um, being and the being looked surprised that I could see her. That's what I sort of registered that facial expression to mean. Either I'm surprised you can see me or I'm surprised you're awake. You're not supposed to be awake. And it's something one of those two or both. And it proceeded to back up, still facing me, and then went right through the wall. And then I did something at the time that made no sense to me. And I really wrestled with until later on, I learned in the lore, it's not so unusual. I turned around and went right back to bed as if that's what you do after you see a being pass through a wall. Now, my wife actually saw the come back through the wall. So when I turned to come back towards the bed, facing away from the being, the being proceeded to walk down the hallway and through the front door, not opening the door, but through the front door of the hotel room. And um, I probably would have fallen asleep and the next day wondered if it was a weird dream or something. Again, this weird, you know, frames of reality gets complicated here. But she sort of shook me out of my stupor and said, what are you doing? How can you go to sleep after what we just saw? And so that was a, was a huge blessing that I saw it with somebody, I witnessed it with someone because it totally grounds it in reality in a very different way. So we got out of there quickly. Um, and I remember bringing it up with friends and family and they just like quickly move on to what's the weather like, you know, or how's your favorite sports team doing? Cause they didn't know what to do. Right. Um, so then later on in the 2010s, I became more and more interested in the lore. And as it began to gain traction in the mainstream through articles like Ralph and Leslie Kane's article in New York times, um, and it was clear that this was beginning to be integrated into our zeitgeist in a way that was not just X-Files territory. Um, I really poured into it. And then it kind of was a conglomeration of all the things I'm fascinated by, not just the notion of aliens, but frames of reality beyond this one, uh, survival beyond death, right? How much the, for instance, with the Kenneth Ring research that was done, how much a contact experience with an apparent non-human being overlaps with NDE research in terms of how it changes the people when they come back, right? So this is, again, what I would say to some of the skeptics of NDE research is, so regardless of what you are trying to say it is, some sort of laugh, last hurrah of a dying brain or whatever, how does that explain the ongoing persistent changes in the people that have encountered these things? They are acting like people who have entered a realm that feels more real than real, more substantive to this one, to the point where when they return here, by contrast, this feels like a matrix or some sort of construct, some simulation. It's going to be a lot that we're going to want to unpack there because one of the real issues I want to drive towards is, you know, my thing does uh, ET have an NDE, which is just trying to be quick and witty about it. But, you know, right. we both know Ray Hernandez, right? You know him. Have you spoken yep. with Ray? So what, it was funny when you were telling your story. Do you know Ray's uh, story about contact? Cause I do. It's, I do. It's a mere, it's a mere uh, of, of your story, right? His his wife is downstairs having this incredible encounter with this non-human intelligence being after they had seen craft in the sky with his daughter and the neighbors. And then Ray walks three steps down the stairs and says, oh, this is nothing. Go back and go to sleep, you know? And like, like you, it's the next day. This is completely incongruent with what I would normally, you know, I'd be down there trying to yeah. 
do what I can, protect my wife, protect the house. And then there's this healing event where the dog that they're going to put down the next day is healed and is running around the room. So this is the phenomenology part of it. You just touched on it, but I hate always, you have to do it, but I hate always referencing the skeptics. Well, if skeptics could only hear this or that, no, that's not the point. People want to ignore this data, you know, disassociate themselves from either the events they've had themselves or the events that other people have had. What I'm interested in is how to begin to incorporate it in a way that challenges it in the way that we would want it to be challenged. It was scientific. So maybe that leads us to the point that you were just making about Kenneth Ring and the parallels between near-death experience and encounter experiences. Yeah, absolutely. And, and just to quickly pick up where I was before we went to what you just said there, how it connects to the John Mack Institute. So basically, because of what you found compelling about my work, I hope, um, about the way I'm trying to take a broad perspective, a deep perspective, and see these overlaps. And I have championed how experiencers are having real experiences that we should take seriously, even though they do challenge our paradigms. The executive director of the John Mack Institute was actually in a U-Haul, moving all the boxes of all John's archives from Harvard down to Rice University and Archives of the Impossible and had a multiple day trip and ended up listening because the driver of the U-Haul was a fan of my podcast, put on my podcast and they listened to my podcast for like two days, basically straight. And she was impressed by the way I talked about the depth and the breadth and the way I connected things and the way I championed experience for testimony because she was one of the people John worked with in the 90s that figures prominently in his books. So she contacted me, we totally gelled, and that's the long and short story of how I became the communications director. I didn't know that. I didn't pick that yeah. up. But you know, yeah. back to your point of like coincidence, is there such a thing? Planned yeah. connections. You know, we've all met these people in our lives when we go, no, that's too weird, you know. Exactly. It's what I call synchronistic orchestration. That's what it feels like, right? My friend Mike Master is a good friend of mine who has been a champion of the extratempestrial hypothesis, the notion that they are us from the future in some way. Um, he also has had this experience of going from being a physicalist and an atheist to within a few years, completely revolutionizing that perspective, turning it upside down. Now he understands consciousness is primary, not just because of his research, because of his own experiences. So again, this overlap between why we have an interest in this field and how we've kind of been called into it becomes a really interesting question. Um, but absolutely with the NDE research, one thing I wanna to say too is that to your point, Absolutely. The evidence is compelling. Dean Radin's research is compelling in so many ways. He knows he has to uh, adhere to a higher degree of rigor than almost anybody else because he's going to be held to a false standard that nobody else is being held to. And yet it still has not really moved the needle very much within the mainstream. Now, within the NDE research, one thing that's really fascinating, when you sort of cross over then into reincarnation studies, not sure if you've seen this, but there have been studies done by universities in the US where they will compare accounts of children, right, who have remarkably clear, succinct, um, and not publicly available memories of previous lives, that they're able to verify, they're able to track down these people that they were related to in a previous life, they're able to confirm elements that are not part of the public record, uh, really minute details, right? But what's fascinating about that too is that there's a subtle difference, or maybe not so subtle actually, there are some distinct differences in how reincarnation seems to manifest for people in Asia, for instance, versus people in Europe and North America. So this, again, undermines what we think of reality. We think of reality as being this thing that's out there, that's separate from us, that's subjective. And yet we see even in reincarnation research that our expectations of reality play a role in what manifests even in the next lifetime. So this is not a subtle shift that physicalists are going to make. This completely turns everything upside down. See, I'm willing to go there, but I'm not convinced. Like at every turn... Again, the inquiry to perpetuate doubt. What I like is that you're engaging with the scientific method in a very real way in these areas that everyone has just kind of thrown up their hands and go, oh, well, we can't think about that. Or even just right now, we can't talk about it. So here's how I would talk about that, is that the number of cases we have in the U.S. is so limited that it isn't really a fair comparison at this point. And the ability to take the cultural uh, overlay, however we understand that to be part of it, also isn't fully understood. So when we look at the University of Virginia and their reincarnation research, I don't think we can 
I don't think I'm ready to draw the conclusion that the cultural overlay is so strong that it's influencing how the reincarnation experience manifests. Maybe, but maybe not. And like, so that would be one question there. And I'd apply that same thing, however you want to get there, to the near-death experience versus the, what do you call it? Because I don't want to misrepresent it, contact experience, which I think, again, this is one of those things, we shouldn't have to say this, but if you can't embrace that data to some extent, then you're just not part of this conversation. And you need to just go back and listen to Lex Gould over Sam Harris and, you know, all these kind of guys who are just committed to this they just have a belief system. They're just religious fundamentalists in a different right. way. And my cheeky way of asking that question is, does E.T. have an NDE? Yeah, yeah. Give me some leeway here because I would like to address that at some length. So I think, number one, I'm going to, again, stretch the parameters, right, and say that um, I would say it seems to be a violation of apparent sovereignty and agency, right? But Again, there is evidence in the data itself, which I am very familiar with, you know, pouring through the John Mack archives and the Struber archives at this point. And what people often remember, you probably have come across this in your research, that sometimes there's this understanding they come across that prior to this incarnation, they actually agreed to this, that it's part of some oversoul structure that transcends the body mind that we inhabit in one lifetime. Now, I understand some people might say that just sounds like Stockholm syndrome. That sounds like making up stories to justify what looks like a clear violation of human rights. But again, each of these different bodies of data bleed into each other. So NDEs bleed into contact experience, bleed into reincarnation experience. And to your question about does an ET have an NDE, I will complicate that a little bit further and say many of the people, a certain percentage of abductees, when they're in the presence of these other beings, they actually remember them. There's often a block, but once the block is removed, they remember these beings and sometimes recognize that they were a gray in a previous lifetime, or even that they might have a certain part of their mentality now that has a persona. So Susie Hansen wrote this book, The Dual Soul Connection, that basically represents that, that she basically has these two different modalities. And when she's on board the craft, a different persona comes to the fore, and then she goes back to a different persona in this construct. So again, the physicalist notion about how we will set the parameters, that this is all there is, I'm just an accident of you know physiology coming together, having this thing I think is consciousness, but it's just a fluke. And therefore, the only way I will evaluate whether I have agency and sovereignty is whether or not I remember in this lifetime giving permission, writing a form or something. But I think, again, the data itself complicates that picture, and we have to follow the data wherever it takes us. Please go on there, because you have a very nuanced and deep understanding of what people generally talk about hybrids, and you extend that into this time dimension? I would say that there are some elements of the overlap, the intersection between the NDE research and the contact research that would suggest it's happening in similar realms of existence or states of consciousness. And that in itself is interesting. And both of them seem to supersede and transcend and feel more real and substantive than this reality does. So for those who haven't had that kind of experience, it's very hard for them to imagine what it would be like because they don't have the contrast. But once people have had either of those experiences, they tend to view that as more real than this. And it helps them also recognize that this is an experience they're having as a soul going through multiple incarnations in order to grow in soul wisdom, basically. Part of the complication here there's many complications, but one is that people tend to think about spiritual history, religious history, and they think about spiritual beings. They don't think about technology. What's complicated about the grays and the abduction research and the hybridization research is that it seems to transcend these categories. It subsumes these categories that we assume exist, or these ways of organizing reality that have existed in our cultures between religions and science, for instance. So with the greys, they seem to use technology and science and DNA, but all in the service of what I would call soul science, actually this incarnational experience over multiple lifetimes. And that's definitely part of the lore that they have actually reported this to abductees, that this is what they do, that we as sovereign beings choose to come into this incarnation. We sign up for everything that happens to us. But they work on a sort of species-wide level to the point you brought up with Brent, uh, with 
Um, who is it that did the research about? Yeah, Bruce. The, yeah, Bruce. Right. That there seems to be indications in our history that we've been tweaked, we've been augmented, whatnot. Maybe we were even a seeded species. So some people think of those as two distinct realms of research. I would say that they actually intersect. That you, in the picture, end up with something where we as sovereign souls choose to come into this incarnation, and then we become part of the process the greys are involved in, and more than just the greys, but on a species-wide kind of level that includes both soul and science, which is a kind of soul science. So when we start asking questions about human rights and things like that, and I do hear people sometimes saying things like, they abduct you, that's that's kidnapping, right? They touch you without asking first, that's assault, right? And the challenge is, again, all the assumptions that are brought to the table that we never think to question. And those assumptions don't play well with the data itself. I'd love to give an example here just to underline this point. And I think it helps to connect the NDE, the reincarnational, and the contact experience, right? So this one friend of mine, she told me her case where when she was a baby, basically, toddler, um, she ended up on Christmas Day eating a bunch of wrapping paper while her parents were in the kitchen and she ended up choking and she had a near-death experience. And she found herself suddenly on board a UFO with alien beings who she immediately, some sort of filter went down and she recognized them and she said, I'm finally home, right? Which is what you hear in NDE research too, right? This source, this home. And she's like, I'm so thankful that I'm back with you. And that was a crazy place down there. And then they say to her, well, don't forget, though, you have a mission here, right? And then she remembered, yes, she signed up for this. And in fact, she uh, was the daughter of two drug addicts. And she knew that she had agreed to go in to help bring light and spread consciousness amongst the people that she was uh, you know, living with and growing up with. But in that moment, she had a full adult perspective and said, oh, no, I have to go back into that toddler body. It can't even like stand up. It just rolls over. Uh, but because she was reintroduced to this conviction that this is what she had signed up for. She did come back into her body and went on to, you know, now she's in her twenties or thirties and living life. And that's been, um, you know, uh, an orienting uh, experience in her entire life. So in that one event, you have overlaps between NDE contact and reincarnation and a sense of mission and purpose. So when people try to, again, make this argument about ethics, I think what we need is a multidimensional ethics. This is one of the things we're talking about at the John Mack Institute. How do we widen the frame? How do we let the data dictate how we should ask more open-ended questions? Yeah. See, this is exactly the conversation that I am super excited that you're having, because I see it quite differently in some significant ways. Like, I just throw in, you know, like you were talking about uh, Jeff Kripal, fantastic, had him on the show multiple times down there at Rice University, he's authored a bunch of books. One of the books, did you read his book with uh, Elizabeth Crone, the woman who- I did. Struck by lightning, right? Hey, struck by, the, uh, chained by the light? No. Changed it was in a flash, I think. Changed yeah. in a flash or something? Something um, like that, but yeah, I read the book, yeah. So I, I thought she had a very brilliant insight. And this is like the challenge that, I'm going kind of to the next level on this. I hope people are following. This discussion we're going to have right now is the kind of discussion that we need to formalize and figure out how to do it in a way that has substance and meaning from a scientific standpoint. And at the same time, it's impossible to do because we're talking about anecdotes. But as we know, anecdotes become case studies and case studies become the rock foundation of everything we know about medicine, certainly. So one of the things that Elizabeth says, I think it's really, really an insight that I hadn't heard before, is she goes, all this thing about growth. No, your soul is completely perfect, which you're nodding your head because from a non-dual perspective, we can immediately shift around and go, yeah, I guess I do know that. So it's more of, and this is what I've heard you say too, this jives with another thing you've said, it's more of an experiential thing. It's more of a continuing to experience, but she really pushes against the idea of learning and the school and you have to kind of know your mistakes and this and that. And I thought that was an interesting insight. So whether it's true or not, it's an important distinction between what she's saying and I'm advocating and what you're saying and you're advocating. Yeah, absolutely. I do want to talk about that because in my Essence of Being classes, which by the way, so I started this Essence of Being initiative where I teach these classes, not just about non-duality and sort of role in UFO phenomenon kind of information, but primarily it's about 
this consciousness piece we're talking about, that when you actually recognize and begin to practice life as if there's an interconnected field, which you are a part of, and you can tune into, there's vast troves of information available to you that you're just tuning out because you're buying into the consensus narrative. So it's kind of like a muscle you have to begin to use, a subtle anatomy that you can begin to develop. So that's a big part of what I do. And in those classes, I make the distinction between the relative and the absolute. So I sometimes hear people say, it's either this or it's this. And what I want to say is, well, it depends which perspective you're speaking from, again, from a non-dual perspective. In the relative, we do experience trauma. We do feel like we're baked into this reality and it feels real and it feels experientially impacting on us. And it feels like we have skin in the game. On the other hand, in the absolute perspective, everything's perfect. Everything's seamless. Everything is prior to and beyond manifestation. And so it's completely this undifferentiated sea of consciousness in its perfect form. Now, I would say that when you, again, according to the non-dual traditions, when you take on a perspective, it, when you enter an incarnation, you are by definition limiting yourself. So to have one perspective so that you then have a vantage point from which you can have conscious experience, learn from that experience from a unique perspective that has never existed anywhere else in the cosmos before. And then when you move through different lifetimes, you eventually contribute that understanding, that wealth of wisdom that has come from firsthand experience, and you contribute that to the whole and through this ultimate reunification with source. So for me, it's both and. There is this underlying perfection, but in the relative experience, there is a transmutation of energy via catalysts that come our way in experience. That's my view. So this is where it kind of gets interesting, but I think there's a distinction there. So I agree with right. you, you know, the kind of relative absolute, we all get that, you know, do nothing. It's all perfect. You get that. But Elizabeth is saying something specifically different about our process, about how we are experiencing uh, life in the same way. And so there's a distinction to be made there in terms of this school that we're in, soul school that we're in, and what she's saying. So I just think we need to be able to drill down and really hone in on those distinctions. Another distinction we made previous in this conversation was about reincarnation. Oh, it seems to manifest differently in some cultures in the West than it does in the reported cases of the East. Maybe not. Maybe that's just, again, so these are the kind of distinctions. So the next distinction I'd make or, or try and make is about the, is there a distinction to be made between the near-death experience and some of these other experiences in the extended consciousness realm? So I can acknowledge and fully embrace, because I think it's super important, the data you're bringing forward about the points of convergence, the points of overlap. But we still, that does not answer the question, is are they in some way fundamentally different? And I think the pushback that I would give and I think other people would give is it's not so easy to gloss over the kind of coercion, deception, not only screen memories, but trauma that is induced. You don't see any of that near-death experience. You don't. And, and people who want to do this, ah, oh, the thing that gets me is the soul trap thing. And I didn't even want to mention it, but it's just another misdirect. It's another cherry picking of the data, reinterpreting of the data. Go to Jeff Long, Dr. Jeff Long, radiation oncologist, carefully collected 4,000, 5,000, 8,000, I don't know how many at this point. Ask Jeff, I've had him on the show multiple times. What's the number one thing that comes through statistically from a medical survey is love love at a percentage of like 96%. You don't get that in the contact experience. I'm not saying I know what that means, but I'm saying as this next level, applying the scientific method, it's not there. The deception, people want to, you know, again, the soul trap people want to go, oh, it's deception. And then it's really not there in the literature. That's not what people report that they're being deceived. So I, I think there's some important, potentially some important distinctions to be made there. Right. And and so I would say I'm I'm very happy to hold a complicated perspective and I don't feel the need to uh, reduce cognitive dissonance by landing on a clean position that leaves no residue hanging outside the suitcase. Um, so I recognize that there is complexity with the abduction scenario, for instance, because my friend Stuart Davis uh, would make the point and has made the point that if nothing else, 
Um, the graves need to do more anthropological research on us so that they understand how to communicate in a way that's kinder, that their bedside manner could be improved. I know people who, speaking of, for instance, with the abduction and hybridization part that you brought up earlier, let me give you another anecdote, um, which, by the way, is a quick aside on anecdotes. So I recently had the chance to speak with some government people and people from the military who are dealing with this topic from their insider perspective. And I asked how often they were considering experience for literature and data when they have their briefings. And the answer was never. And that's problematic to me. Right. And I said to them, if you had people who were captured by Al Qaeda and spent two weeks in Iraq and then got released, you would brief them for days trying to learn everything you could about Al Qaeda, right? And their experience. Somehow we don't treat it to the same standard when it comes to abductees, which is strange to me. And then we go and hear them say things publicly like, we have no idea who these beings are or what they want. And that's not true based on the evidence. Now, but to your point, the evidence is not, it's not simple. It's not clean. It does beg the question. Sometimes you hear examples where only once the person's screaming, do they then do some sort of mental thing where it makes the pain go away? Why not do that before they're screaming, right? I understand. Now, here we even have to be wary of you know, anthropocentrism. We have to be careful that we assume they should know these things. They should know better. We assume that if they're higher beings, right, then they would know all of that we know and more. But I think that's a dangerous assumption to make. And I think they can also learn from us and might have some gaps in their perspective. And if they are either a different species altogether or some further version of us that's followed a different you know, evolutionary trajectory, then their experience of reality and even personhood might be different enough that it makes it difficult for them to relate to the way that we are so tied and connected to our body. Like they will actually say in the abduction literature that they see themselves basically as this energetic um, persona moving through bodies across incarnations. And they are sometimes perplexed by the degree to which we are identified with our bodies, which again, is not to explain away some of the data. I understand it's complicated. I'm just saying, let's open it up even more. Well, <laughs> open it up, but I think we have to nail it down at the same time, because right. what I'm suggesting is that we have to consider the hypothesis that the near-death experience realm, let's just call it a realm, qualitatively significantly different from these other realms. There is a higher spiritual realm that we don't have to try and pin down or attach to any religion for God's sake or anything like that. But we just say right. it is operating in a different way and that there is the chance that these other realms are mimicking that in a way that for whatever nefarious reasons they have. So that returns to the story of Mary Rodwell and David Jacobs. So I'm interviewing them both and it's really interesting, David Jacobs, it's all dark, it's all manipulation. And Mary Radwell is, no, it's soul growth and spiritual and all the rest of this. So finally, I get to Mary, I go, David insists that it's a program, operation. She thinks, and she goes, oh, yeah, it's a program. It's a program, as in government program. It's not a government program, but in the sense that we think about it, in the sense that you talk about it. I think, you know, you bring evidence forth in terms of hybridization, and you go, yeah, that does seem to be like you just attached it to technology, a gray technology, da, 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 all that stuff. So that is a distinction that I don't find in the near-death experience literature. No one comes, I don't want to say no one, but again, Jeff, look at the statistics, 96, 94%, remember all this. In the high 90s, people are coming back and not saying it's a program. And they would, if you, it, I'm inferring from what, their full accounts are, if you suggested that it was a program, they'd be like, no, it's not a program. No, it's not a soul trap. No, it's not any of those things. It's something different. And we can start saying all these bunch of stuff and hang a bunch of stuff on how different it is, but it is not that. I totally agree with you. Like, I'm definitely not trying to flatten everything here and say they're basically the same thing. Uh, I actually do believe that um, an NDE is real, that it's tapping into something uh, that subsumes our physical reality, what we perceive as our physical reality. And it's not the same as contact experiences. What I would say, though, is that I would, again, um, argue for a spectrum rather than an either or. So rather than thinking about this mortal construct and then some um, transcendent realm where people experience an NDE, I would say that perhaps some of these other beings 
have a, a deeper understanding of the nature of reality itself, and there's more of a spectrum, and they are able to uh, inhabit some of these ranges within a bandwidth maybe that approximate or get closer to that sort of subsuming realm. And that's why there's some overlap. Because another piece I'd just like to introduce is, as part of the data, which you probably have heard about, which I think people should know about, is one of the, the intersections, again, between these pools of people is that if you've had one of these types of experiences, you're more likely than someone from the average population to have one of the others. And on top of that, both in Elizabeth Crone's case, as well as contact experiences, they come back often with psi capacities online that did not exist prior to that. So there is some overlap and intersection, even though I wouldn't flatten and say it's the same thing. Oh, I think that's very well said. That's the kind of next level stuff that I think we have to, though, find a way to be more uh, systematic, methodical, logical about really analyzing that and laying out those frameworks. And again, I won't jump on the AI thing, but AI just does a fantastic job of that. I didn't realize you have that programming background. You're not convinced as I am as much at this point. But the reason I think AI can do it so well is not because it's so brilliant at this point in making inferences and doing all that. It's just that we're so terrible at it. We are so biased and our bias just drowns our ability to apply any kind of reason or logic, but then we easily get offended and we have to pridefully defend stupid positions and stuff like that. AI just a million times better. Like I just said, the thing with Bruce Fenton, 10 minutes, you, boom, you get to the answer. You could spend an hour doing that. Let me just say something on that because I'd like to clarify my position. So like Bernardo, I'm suspicious of the notion, skeptical of the notion that AI will become self-aware in the same way that we are. But that doesn't mean it's not going to be incredibly powerful and change the nature of reality. I think it will. On top of that, there's an additional question that people often don't bring in, which is, could an outside intelligence leverage AI to actually impact our reality? I think, I mean, I know people that are deeply in AI, some of the CEOs of companies who are also into this field, who've seen some evidence of that. And I will also say that one of the things that's frustrating, I wouldn't was invited to be part of this AI symposium where we're giving different perspectives on the future. This one person had this perspective. Well, the good news is that the good people in the Bay Area make sure that ideology doesn't end up in the responses of AI, right? So they scrub it. And my point was, I'm glad they do that. But in so doing, they also scrub all the UFO data because that's considered outside the norm, right? So you're biasing AI and what it can do in terms of its responses. And sometimes I think even what you came across there where it gave you an initial response and then you ask a deeper reasoning question and then it was able to, some of those initial first layer superficial responses are often biased by our own prejudice. And we, again, this is where I think we go astray when we think that we need to make sure that AI is not being biased by you know Nazi ideology. But again, modern conventional physicalist ideology also ends up in there. But I completely agree with you. And I have made this argument in terms of this AI project I'm involved in with Archives of the Impossible. We're taking John Mack archives and the Struber archives and using AI on it. One of the things I'm looking forward to is what it can pull out in terms of patterns that we never think to look for. So I absolutely agree with you on that. And I'm looking forward to what what will come with that. Well, great. We'll have to talk some more about it right now because uh, I started a podcast a while ago, just a few months ago, called AI Truth Ethics Podcast. And I've interviewed some, I think, pretty great people so far in this AI ethics thing. And it's a complete uh, problem reaction solution dialectic, in my opinion. It is a cover, a misdirect to control speech and to do what they've done all along. So I got to bring it up to you. I mean, people haven't seen the Mark Zuckerberg letter that he just published just a couple months ago where he said, hey, lay off. You know, yes, I censored the crap out of people, but the White House was pushing me to do it on the COVID issue. And of course, on the Hunter Biden laptop thing, but particularly he was talking about COVID. He goes, yeah, I had to. He goes, look at my position. I want to go to Europe. I have all these things that I want to get done in Europe politically. I need government support for that. This is fascism, right? They lean on me and say, you don't do this. You censor these people or, you know, you're not going to get this. So AI is just an advanced tool for implementing that kind of control. And now you add to it, you know, the engagement that we have with it, the anthropomorphizing that we have with it. That's where their energy is going, not to, you know, how we can prevent Nazi hate speech. What a false, phony cover story. What they really want is to be able to control free speech and to be able to control 
uh, the narrative in the way that they've done. And I just published three more shows on that where I, we did evidence, you know, right on the show where they're doing that. And you can see the difference between the models and how some models are doing it and some models aren't. So I think there's conclusive evidence that that is what's going on there. Then I think that factors into this evil thing, which I think is super, super important. You know, when I asked Bernardo about Yuval Harari, and he doesn't know who Yuval Harari is, and he doesn't know World Economic Forum, and he doesn't know transhumanism, the best I can offer you is uh, drugs and video games. And if you don't understand that agenda, that that is a real agenda, whether you subscribe to it or whether you think it's going to dominate or not, it is a real agenda, then I think you, you're not really capable of having a real discussion about AI, certainly. But I think you also are crippled in having a real discussion about these extended consciousness realms, because these guys have known about these extended consciousness realms. Like we talked about remote viewing. I mean, Hal put up and Russell Targ weren't exactly wringing their hands saying, oh my God, this defies physicalist science. Maybe we should stop right here. No. Yeah, so a lot to chew on there. So um, absolutely on the um, censorship that happens um, and that, again, the problem is concentration of power. So you've got a few of these companies who, like you say, if they want to be global, they have to adjust their algorithms and whatnot um, to follow laws in Europe that are different than here. But hold on, uh, hold on Darren. Full stop. It's not the companies. It's the deep state, right? Sure. Zuckerberg is right. saying, it's not me, you guys. I don't want, because right. from a, and people don't get this if they don't have the business background. He's saying it between the lines. Censorship is bad for business. My customers right. don't like censorship. They don't like examples of censorship. This is fascism. This is deep state. This is unelected officials in the CIA and the FBI telling me to do stuff. It's not companies. Right. It's not Elon Musk. It's not Zuckerberg. Totally agree. And you hear notions about Google Maps and Google Earth. Before they could release that publicly, they had to agree to all sorts of censorship that the CIA was directing. Absolutely. I think they understand that to play the game and to be public, they have to first adhere to these rules that is being set by, if you want to call it the deep state, fair enough. Um, I think that's true. One of the things I like to point out with AI, you know, you often hear this argument that's made that every new technology People will argue this is going to destroy us or this is going to liberate us, right? So it happened with radio, it happened with television, it happened with the internet, and now we have AI. Now, what I think is perplexing and frustrating for me is that I also, like you, hold amazing promise for what AI can become and the global problems it could help us solve because you can give it a million hyperparameters if you need to, and it can handle that, it's able to do what communism was never able to do. Right? When you've got a few bureaucrats at the Kremlin trying to make decisions for every region in the Soviet Union, that's an incredibly inaccurate process, which ends up being a lot worse in effect than a free market system that tends to balance because of the way the nature of the market works. Because of where AI is going, we're going to have to come up with some sort of model that supersedes, transcends capitalism, because AI is going to undo the labor market eventually. And you and I were talking about, you know, for instance, as programmers, within the space of two years, it's completely changed the nature of how someone does programming now. And, you know, when you hear people like Sam Altman saying, by 2030, you're going to have a piece of glass that will do everything for you, right? Um, I don't think that's an exaggeration. And, and the change is happening at this exponential level. We seem to be approaching some sort of singularity. But like you, to address some of your earlier comments, I have major concerns about uh, when we march towards that singularity with a physicalist notion of ourselves, where we think the only way we can achieve immortality is to somehow integrate ourselves, uh, merge ourselves with technology and machines, I think that that undermines who we ultimately are and misses the entire point of the enterprise. I think transcending capitalism completely misses the point in the way exactly that you're talking about. Human flourishing, human consciousness, human free will has to be protected. And if anything we've learned in the last hundred years is that the enemies of that are the enemies of truth, and those are really the people that we should be against. So when it comes down to notions of kind of, you know, like I said, embracing, hey, communism is great if they just could manage it better. No, that's, that's Yuval Harari, that's transhumanism, that's making people feel this nihilistic, you are meaningless, because the universe is meaningless. So how could you be any meaning in, meaning in your life? And that AI will 
change everything. So, you know, drugs and uh, video games are the best you can offer you. I think Sam Altman is much closer to the truth. Sam Altman with his, yes, we're going to change the social contract with AI, clearly. And I think he's not the first one to say that, but that's true. But what happens when the, the price of labor goes down dramatically, like 95%, is not uh, necessarily a bad thing. And it can completely be compatible with the free market kind of system. And it's completely compatible with human flourishing on this other level. So that's a really interesting political discussion to have because I don't think it's a political discussion. I think it's a discussion about what's behind the transhumanist agenda. And, but to get there, you have to understand that transhumanism is real and it's real on this spiritual level. It's Aleister Crowley, you know, it's create better than the creator gods. I don't want to be confined by a moral imperative. One of the things I think is clear from the near-death experience science, but is less clear with the contact experience, is the idea of a moral imperative. No one comes back and says there isn't right or wrong. They come back and say, no, there is this deep-seated sense of right and wrong. I wrote a book a couple of years ago called Why Evil Matters. A couple of people I interviewed for this book, one was a, a FBI undercover agent who was working with the NAMBLA, you know, the guys they made fun of in South Park, the pedophiles, right? So they get together for their pedophile little outings. And one of them was in Times Square at the old uh, Toys R Us thing. And he said, hearing these men talk about not just the sexual acts that they want to engage with these children, but the pain that they want to inflict. And he said, you know, it was everything I could do to keep from just throwing them over that rail, you know? And then the other person I interviewed was a woman named Annika Lucas, who was, I don't know if you ever heard of the Dutro kind of child sex trafficking thing in Belgium, but it became a big thing because it was in the papers. These kids were in cages and they died in their cages because they arrested Dutro and he was tied up and he couldn't feed his, uh, his victims, these young children who were in these cages. She was sold into sex slavery in Belgium at six years old and horrific kind of thing. And the reason I bring that up and the reason, because evil, <laughs> I was talking about being like, well, I don't know about evil. I see it as, you know, kind of learned or unlearned or, you know, uh, growing or not growing. But when you bring that, they go, fuck yes, that's evil. I don't know how else to process it, but it's somehow evil in some way that I can't fully understand in the same way that I read the near-death experience accounts and I go, that's good. That's light in some way that I can't maybe understand. But my point is, I think we need to try and understand that because if we're in this world thinking that there isn't evil and that there aren't people with malevolent intent and they may be using Yuval Harari to advance these kind of agendas, to tell us that we're meaningless, to advance this AI thing that, oh, don't worry, give everything up to AI. I just don't think we can get to that next level of really having these discussions if we don't acknowledge that or bring that to the table. Yeah. So I think we have a lot of overlap, maybe some subtle distinctions too. So let me first of all, just go back to the AI part. Then we'll come back to the, the the evil aspect. So with the AI thing, I'm not arguing for communism. What I'm saying though, is that we actually now have an intelligence that we can ask for it. If it's programmed in the right way, we can ask it to uh, come up with solutions that do serve the greatest good, which again, I'm, I'm acknowledging the difference between good and evil. And one of the definitions for me is that um, you have an ever-increasing circle of care and concern. So you want to be making decisions that impact the greatest number of people and beings, the biosphere, the animals, the and whatnot, um, positively. And we can do that. And in some ways, AI, um, if it's done, again, correctly, which I'm not at all convinced it's going to be, um, we could uh, ask it to act in ways that uh, overcome some of the selfishness that is part of um, the way that our economies work. While AI could be this miraculous opportunity for us to change the nature of our civilization and free up people and allow consciousness to flourish, instead what I see us doing is racing headlong against the Chinese to get to AGI um, as soon as we can. And in so doing, we're not taking the steps and considering like a tribe would do what is in the best interest of the whole and how we make sure we don't make missteps or we're rushing towards AGI. So I have concerns about how that's happening. I have concerns about how 
different ethicists have resigned from the board at OpenAI because they feel like their concerns are not being considered. I think when you put AI only in the hands of a capitalist system, it can quickly put us in a position where we didn't take the time to do the homework we needed to do. If it's used correctly, again, I think it could be the biggest revolution in the history of the planet. Now, one of the things you sent me was a comment from Dean, and he had a notion. So it was interesting to me that you kind of looked at that as transhumanism, this hive mind thing. So this is something else that comes up in the contact literature that, again, often people in our context were used to, especially in America, we have this rugged individualism kind of sort of ideal, but... So when people hear about some sort of hive mind, even amongst the greys, they think of the Borg on Star Trek, and it's all these negative connotations. But I tend to actually agree with Dean Radin here that if we are to let this fundamental interconnectivity reign, we ideally get to a point where we have individuality, but like holons, right? So a holon is something that is an individual, but it's also part of something larger. And you have this kind of nested fractal structure, right? Where molecules form cells, which form organs, which fill bodies, which form species, which form ecosystems, planetary civilizations, on it goes. I think that the more we can actually have a, a porous sense of identity, where I do identify as Darren King, right? But I am also recognizing that I'm more than that. And I can actually um, express my agency uh, without being defined by that limited kind of sense of parameters. I think that's where we need to go. And I think that's the nature of reality. Getting back to the non-dual thing again, okay. the nature of reality is everything's perfect and interconnected. And all the intelligence we need, all the solutions are already in the environment. It's in the illusion of separation and our misapprehension of who we are and how we're connected that all these problems arise. So I can get to a problem of evil in a second. And while I do think that's a fair caricature of what goes on, much of the problems that arise personally, interpersonally, and collectively, I see as being an implication of the illusion of separation. Yeah, so th th we're, we're getting to kind of a great point because we're uh, kind of stripping away, I think, what amounts to what a lot of people call political differences. And I'm apolitical, I'm not voting for Trump. I didn't vote for Trump before. I won't vote for him. But I certainly won't vote for the people on the other side. They're a lot worse, a lot worse. So I don't know who, who to vote for. And I'm a political. I think it's the Crips versus the Bloods. But look at what Dean Radin is really saying there. I got to say, Darren, this is like a, mm -hmm. a meaningful point where our opinions might diverge or maybe we can bring them back together. But anyways, listen to what Dean Radin says. He says, I want to give you the jab, right? The mRNA jab. Which, by the way, in that interview, which was taken down from uh, YouTube, not for it was on there for a while, and then uh, somebody must have uh, kind of caught on to it. it. You know, this was at the time when, after the jab, if you remember, the jab was extremely dangerous, most dangerous in history, and not effective. And the United States Army had the database that they've always had and available to the public that was showing a six hundred percent increase in heart conditions among troops who had taken the jab, you know? So this is public. It's in the Congress. The guy's, you know, saying it. So what did they do? Well, they took down the database. First time in history, <laughs> not available. Don't let that date out. So I asked Dean about that. I said, you know, you want to plow forward with this mRNA. They already ran the experiment once and it was horrible. And what was his response? Hey, you know, if we needed to break a few eggs to get the omelet made, you know, so do it. But more to the point is, do you remember what his excuse was for how horrible things were and how we had to jab people into giving them the hive mind? Ukraine. Ukraine. He goes, look at the people in Ukraine, that war that are killing each other over that. What is your understanding of, of Ukraine? Well, so first of all, I just want to hear what you're saying and clarify what Dean Radin's saying. So are you saying that... Uh, He's not just talking about evolving to some sense of having some sort of collective intelligence. You're saying that he's suggesting we use technology and medication to force it upon the population. I just want to clarify what you're oh, 100%. saying. 100 percent. That that is his startup, right? He has a biotech startup, right? Using the mRNA technology, which was right. used in the COVID jab, as right. a way of changing your DNA, right? So that's the new tool. That's the new technology at his disposal. And the reason he's in this mix, and when I talk to 
you know, another guy and kind of apologizing for Dean. He goes, well, this is just Dean trying to get fuck you money, you know, which I get, you know, he's at IANS. He doesn't make a ton of money. He's in Silicon Valley. He sees a lot of other people going around making tens, hundreds of millions of dollars. Maybe that's it. But I think whether that's his motivation or not, I think it's it's extremely, extremely concerning to think that someone would think that they could use this biotechnology, the mRNA technology, which again, you know, I did this in the original I interview with Raiden, but you can look up his biotech company and you can look up all that stuff. It's not like a hidden kind of thing. But again, this is what happens with this. This is what happens with, with uh, you know, Ukraine, Ukraine. Now we come to know that we really were completely complicit in egging that on, right? So we it took over Ukraine, we rigged their election, then we invited them into NATO. They drew the line, they said, you just can't do this. This would be like us coming into Canada and saying, well, it's Canada, you know, it's an independent country. We'd go, no, that's our neighbor. You can't do that. You're right on our doorstep. So the situation in Ukraine, at the very least, including their neo-Nazis uh, kind of that we put in when we overthrew that just because they were the power structure, kind of like in Afghanistan when they did that with the different warlord, Taliban. Yeah, the Taliban warlord kind of stuff. Right. But certainly more complex, much more complex than Dean Radin in his Silicon Valley kind of liberal kind of everything should work out just great. Very, very different from that. And that's the guy I want to, to be giving me the jab and say, don't worry, this hive mind will be will be great for you. It's where mm, you want to okay. go. Right. So that that's helpful context. So I, I do agree that the Russia Ukraine thing is more complicated than we are uh, told. Um, and there definitely is a, a degree of propaganda there for sure. Almost every global conflict, I would say, is much more complicated certainly. than a single Absolutely. narrative would allow for. Um, now, I certainly am not arguing for that kind of transhumanism. I'm certainly not arguing for that kind of hive mind whatsoever. And I think where you and I would find a point of convergence, um, even though we might have some differences politically, but I think where we do find a point of convergence is I, I have found one of the interesting um, ways that the data diverges, even amongst like ufology. So ufology tends to skew right, actually, because it's people who are questioning of the government and consensus narratives that also sense there's something that's been covered up in the UFO phenomenon. So it's more of a conservative uh, group of people tend to be going in that direction than progressive or liberals. And part of what I see as a bit of a blind spot for progressives and liberals is they assume that conventional government and the powers that be generally are well-meaning. And I think that's a bit naive. And I, I think that um, in the midst of saying that the abduction uh, scenario is I think more overarchingly positive than people give it credit for. Likewise, I would say that I do see some evidence, and Janice and I have discussed this on Event Horizon, you know, really wrestling with data that sure looks like the powers that be have undermined human freedom, have undermined human health, seemingly deliberately over time. And of course, they have also, with some of the intelligence community and whatnot, have sown so much discord and multiple narratives and released them all like viruses into our field so that people, even when they're trying to claw for what's really true, it, they end up being exhausted or they don't have the time or resources to do it. So I think that looks quite nefarious to me. And I'm very open to the notion, again, but again, being cautious and being skeptical, right? Not jumping, holding some doubt, but I'm certainly open to the notion that there is some sort of global cabal behind the scenes that is not that we, what we see on the surface with our political structures that is, you know, turning the lever, so to speak. and. When you look at some of the Could trends exo of the human health, it seems to be going down over time. Could it be exopolitical? Because that's part of the lore. And I, I think it has major traction. Because if you just deconstruct everything else that you're saying, none of this stuff goes on without some syncing up with whatever the, that exo agency, non-human intelligence agency is. And to me, always the starkest example of that is disclosure, you know. Oh, disclosure, disclosure. Disclosure could happen tomorrow, right? So there is some, and it's also in the lore that we have some elements of our government or world government, and also the whole thing of world government looks a lot different from an exopolitical standpoint. It might be eventually where we have to get, you know, that from an interplanetary thing. It's like, of course, you idiots out there, you can't have 146 different kind of countries. That doesn't work. But there's no transparency there. That's completely deceptive if that is an agenda. But I'm rambling on. 
why can't we connect with what you're saying? Doesn't it fit perfectly with some kind of exopolitical agenda? Yes. And I have equally entertained that because I am so convinced that we live in this really diverse universe, multidimensional cosmos with all sorts of other kinds of intelligences that can, like I said earlier, not only manipulate space time, but can manipulate individual consciousnesses. So examples like, you know, Jacques Vallée has talked about a case where this French family were driving down a busy road. They see what looks like a UAP coming down. They each see something, but what they each see is different than the other. And what actually does get captured on film, which was something, looked like n what none of them saw. And simultaneously, nobody else on the highway seemed to see anything whatsoever. So that shows you how they can custom deliver uh, perceptual experiences, right? And here again, I lean on something like Donald Hoffman's work, saying that, you know, our perception of reality is not a pipeline to ultimate truth, right, in terms of base reality. So it, there's many ways they could step in and manipulate that process. So that being the case, I absolutely think that I argue for a spectrum of consciousness development where not all of these non-human intelligences are, you know, all sunshine and roses and enlightened beings. I think that we're going to find a spectrum there. I think the data itself suggests we find a spectrum. I think part of what we do a disservice to the data is that we collapse and conflate it all and try to make sense of it rather than recognizing there's multiple kinds of beings with different stages of consciousness development. Some are still but, but, very- but Don't say stages of consciousness development. We don't know that th this is advancing towards the good. And that's where I see there's maybe there's a different continuum. Like I love when you were laying out before that they have advanced extended consciousness capabilities that bleed into right. these other realms like near-death experience, but maybe there's a complete and separate difference in terms of alignment with good and uh, in the in the soup with the rest of us who are all a mixture. So I'm not exactly clear on what distinction you're making from what I'm saying. I'm saying that I'm not saying that it's guaranteed that every being will ultimately achieve enlightenment necessarily in a particular construct. What I am saying, though, is that I think we should expect, and it would be foolhardy of us to assume either, and you do hear this in the lore, right? And in, in the UFO community, you get people who argue for them all being demonic, basically, or all angelic, right? And I'm like, that just doesn't play well with the data. So, you know, we have to be very wary of our bias there. Um, what I'm saying is that I do think there may even be a quasi-physical or a completely non-physical kind of intelligence that can manipulate human consciousness and does so a kind of parasitic kind of entity, if you will. That, and again, this is part of the layer that feeds off of fear, that feeds off of suffering, the same way that a parasitic you know, entity that enters your body might consume part of your innards or whatever. I mean, I think that's quite likely. And again, this is one of the reasons why in my Essence of Being initiative, I actually help people to reconnect with this deep, subtle awareness so they can track better their own agency and what's potentially influencing them. And Part of the challenge with modern life is with us being so distracted and buying so much into physicalism, we are basically sitting ducks for some of this parasitic stuff that might be working on a more subconscious level. So I'm fully open to the idea that, um, and even David Grush has kind of hinted at this, right? If we have accords with the military industrial complex and some form of NHI, you have to ask yourself, how enlightened would a group of NHI be that is making accords with the military industrial complex? So I think, again, I think it's complex. Until I'm convinced otherwise by the data, I assume a spectrum, both within humanity and with non-humanity. So, uh, uh, great. I, I love that. And I think he, uh, the point you made about Grush is, is perfect. Well said, right? <laughs> Whatever alliances they're making, we should immediately call into question the motives of both those individuals. So again, if ET is having an NDE, it suggests that it is on a different if you want to call it consciousness evolutionary track completely, that, that would be an hypothesis that I would throw out is that it's a completely different consciousness evolutionary track than all these other shenanigans that we're talking about. So all the really evil stuff that we're talking about and all the very human sounding, I got to get ahead. I got to take over the planet. I got to do this and that. And by the way, open AI, you know, Again, you know, the, the, the kind of capitalist versus uh, uh, socialist kind of view. Open AI, alignment problem, complete hijacking of the narrative, right? They didn't like that he was too open is what they didn't like. 
So they made him go hire a guy from NSA to run the thing, right? So, you know, you say, oh, I'm a little concerned about their safety and others, you know, high level people left because concerned about safety. Bullshit. They were concerned because he wasn't closely enough following the agenda in terms of we got to lock this stuff down. And evidence of that is who they brought in for alignment is NSA. NSA is the guy that you bring in and say, oh, this will keep us free and safe now. But yeah, is there a separate track in these consciousness realms? I don't have any really firm conclusion on that, but that's where the evidence for near-death experience leads me. Well, I think, again, for me, I tend to keep um, going further back into the assumptions or the axioms that give rise to the hypotheses we have in the first place. And many of those axioms have become unquestioned, right? And so as Donald Hoffman likes to say, give me one miracle and then I'll spin up some version of reality, right? But he's Yeah, but he's kind a- of a physicalist, isn't he? At the end of the day, he kind of has some physicalist leanings. And again, we don't know, like we started in this interview an hour and a half ago, that we don't know if it's just because he has to get along with his colleagues and doesn't want to be disinvited from the conferences or stuff like that. But when he's really pushed, he isn't embracing the near-death experience data. He isn't embracing the contactee data. He's still, in a backdoor kind of way, he's still saying there's a substrate, you know? Donald Hoffman? Yeah. So, you know, with the Donald, screen, Donald with the screen, well, well, the I mean, screen and the icons. Has, and, yes. He has said that he sits in front of his colleagues, right? And makes some argument for his model. And then they said, they're just nodding his head. And he's like, I don't think you guys understand. I'm saying neurons don't exist. Your brain has no causal power over your experience. And so I think he's actually making a pretty radical argument for consciousness giving rise and everything we perceive as physicality is just that. It's a perception. It's an epiphenomenon of the evolutionary process. So he's saying that, give me one miracle and I'll spin up physicalism. He's saying, okay, let me assume for a second that consciousness is primary. And then from that, let me see if I can spin up what appears like quantum gravity and space-time, right? And if I can do that, then I'm getting somewhere. Where were we before that? We were talking about I think there's a backdoor physicalism there where they always have to come back to then explaining physicalist phenomenon rather than really breaking free and saying what you say, which is unsatisfying to most people and even unsatisfying to me. And it's the Bernardo thing. It's like, hey, it all is just consciousness at some level. Uh So even his little icons, there's no such thing really as emergence. Emergence is just another level of abstraction from you know that, but I think that becomes problematic if you really try and embrace some of this other data that we're talking about, like particularly near-death experience and, you know, contact experience, unless you're saying, well, that just emerges as well and everything emerges. And that's like, okay, what are we talking about? Darren's right. I'm wrong. Donald Hoffman's not a physicalist. Hope to have him on again soon. Well, so like, so again, my friend, Mike Masters, he and I have had um, conversations because while he's come around to the consciousness piece, he, again, he trained as a biological anthropologist. So he's following Darwinism and those kind of assumptions. And I think this is where I kind of align a little bit with Hoppin in the sense that I can say it's a subset of some larger reality. So it's a self-consistent subset, but that doesn't mean that it's ultimate or that's ground of all being, right? And so when Hoffman says that, and that Bernardo kind of said this too, I think, this is where they kind of align a little bit. He'll say that physics may ultimately be the science of the study of our perception rather than of base reality. I think that's actually getting somewhere because it then opens the question, what might the base reality be? Or again, what might be a spectrum of realities? So one person I want to bring in here, again, speaking of this converging data sets, is Nima Arkhani Hamed, who's a physicist who says that the numbers themselves, the data themselves, tell us that space-time cannot be foundational, right? So Hoffman will often reference him and when he says space-time is doomed. And what he means is it the numbers just don't work, right? So again, this is where you and I would agree that it's in the data. Just look, right? And he's saying that it's very clear that space-time is derivative of some deeper structure. So everything we're talking about today, everything that Bernardo at least gives some you know, hint towards and that Donald Hoffman perhaps is pointing towards is deeper levels of reality, which again might be what people are tapping into in something like a near-death experience, right? Because it would feel more foundational and real because it actually is prior to and beyond and transcends this particular subset. So what I'm saying is that I'm, I'm open to the idea that we could come up with a model of consciousness where you have a subset that ends up looking like physicalism. So again, it's about 
apparent physicalism or apparent physicality versus it being that way. So one of the arguments I make, and I know Bernardo's made this point too, is that if I have a lucid dream, which I do pretty easily, um, I'm going around having what feel like physical experiences. I mean, if I bang my knee in the dream, it hurts, right? When I do different things, it feels real. The reason why I suddenly wake up when I feel like I'm falling is because I feel like I'm going to actually hit the ground and it's going to hurt. But I wouldn't, if someone were to say to me, um, and I were to say to somebody, that's physical, they would say, well, no, it's not. It's just the way your brain is configuring consciousness, right? It's taking on a certain manifestational quality that has the appearance and the qualitative, um, you know, phenomenology of physicality, but that's just a modulation of consciousness. So that's where I, I tend to be with Bernardo. And when he talks about, you know, a whirlpool is ultimately just the river, right? But it can still take on the appearance temporarily of something that seems semi-independent. Yeah, that's great. And the essence of being a program that you put together, I haven't done it, but I listened to a pretty extensive interview on it. Sounds fantastic. It sounds like anyone would gain a lot from that, you know, both in terms of the material you bring and then the experiential aspect to it. And you're well-trained in kind of meditation and non-dual stuff and you're bringing that in and then you have a group, you know, you're creating this like-minded people that bring this energy to it. So I definitely hope people check that out and I'll provide a link to that. As we move towards wrapping things up, and I appreciate all your time today, I guess to poke at you a little bit more on one of the things, because there is this overlay that you have of evolution of consciousness. And I already kind of pushed back with the idea that I think I'm open to Elizabeth's idea that we may be perceiving that in a wrong way. And we may be applying our cultural overlay, Darwinian bullshit about that. And uh, that's one thing I find fascinating about Bruce Fenton. So he's going back 780,000 years and he's pulling these independent scientific aspects of it, the tectites, the gene sequence, the out of Africa stuff, all the rest of it. And then he's saying, now let's connect it with channel material that says these interplanetary uh, wars 780,000 years ago. And here's the evidence of that. And then you go to John Brandenburg and you, you've seen his stuff on the nuclear weapon signature from Mars, you know, 250,000, 550,000 years ago. Hell, man, the idea that we are evolving is just, I, I, I think it is, it does feel kind of ethnocentric in a kind of this expanded kind of way. Like, we are evolving. Now is the special time. we said that forever. It, it seems to me that somehow this aggression is this conquest thing is playing out forever in the timeline as well in a way that I don't want to give some trite explanation for it of like, you know, these are uh, agreements that we made pre-soul. I'm down with that. I On one level, I totally get that. But on another level, it breaks down. It doesn't make sense, you know, in the same way that R Raiden is going to jab you because of the Ukraine thing. And he's never looked into it to say that, gee, that might be a little bit more complicated or China is spending three times as much as we are on AI in the battlefield. Oh, but they're probably our friends, but maybe they're not our friends. Maybe they don't have the best intentions. So the evolution of consciousness and that we are in the dawning of the new age, I'm open to it. I just, I, I think there's counter evidence. So let's say a couple of things. So one part of my history that was pretty informative for me was the integral theory and studying under Ken Wilber. And one of the things that Ken has championed, although he wasn't the originator of this, is spiral dynamics. And so this is, again, compelling data in my point of view. Over time, you do see this, again, assuming that major catastrophes don't happen or people feel like their basic needs are not being met, then they can actually devolve, right? But when those needs are being met, when technology is increasing and people have their basic needs, they have shelter, they have food, whatnot, we see people identifying over time with larger spheres of care and concern. So we have the movement towards something like, rather than just being tribal, we identify as nation states. Then we identify as a particular religion, maybe across nation states. Then we start recognizing human rights, saying that regardless of what your particular religious view is, or whether you have none whatsoever, or if you're, like you say, a fundamentalist atheist, like Sam Harris or whatever, we still recognize that your basic rights should be protected. We now have animal rights, right? We had the civil rights movement that happened. 
we have now recently some acknowledgement that plants seem to have some degree of consciousness. So maybe we need to rethink that. So when you and I talk about this underlying field of interconnected consciousness, where everything ultimately is this cosmic field, then we recognize that everything might be imbued with some degree of consciousness. And we have to consider our, our ethics from that point of view. But I would also argue that as part of that, you have involution and evolution. So in this, and again, this is sort of plays into some of the non-dual traditions, not all of them, but some of them in the sense that you kind of have this cycle, right? Where um, source spills out into manifestation and then all these breadcrumbs are left because of our ultimate nature being this interconnected source. And slowly we, we remember, which is my friend Janice likes to say, is to put together greater parts of ourselves. We recognize we are source. We somehow are uh, source dust, not just stardust. And then we sort of move towards this reunification with source where we recognize actually you and I are not so different. We maybe are fundamentally the same. Maybe this illusion of separation while meaningful is not ultimate, right? So in that sense, for me, I think in the data themselves, you do see that across time, again, assuming cataclysms don't happen, political disruption doesn't happen where people can regress, you do see this evolution of consciousness. And I would also argue that this is a cosmic norm because even for these greys and these other beings, they also are ultimately source, right? So it really, my perspective hinges on non-duality here, that if we're all ultimately part of this connected field, then we all follow this journey in one way or another. Now, I would argue that some of what we're seeing today in terms of greater distortion and dissension in our ranks than ever in some ways, absolutely. And I agree no. with you. And No, what I'm talking about look, with the last 10 years. Of, part of my background is in religious studies. So I agree with you. People have been saying it's the end time, but Jesus is coming back every year of my lifetime, going back into centuries and millennia, right? So yes, everybody always believes this is the moment everything's going down. But I think I would argue that actually at this moment, we're moving towards something like a singularity, although how I might define that might be different than some other people. Um, I think that we are facing um, with our rise in technology, without a requisite advancement of our consciousness understanding, we are potentially encountering numerous existential threats to our entire collective civilization. Um, and so I think where everything's coming down right now is, will there be enough awakening to overcome that? Because I will say this, right? And I know you're open to different kinds of data, not just within the UFO phenomenon, right? One of the most fascinating aspects for me of the people that end up in my essence of being classes is that the UFO phenomenon becomes the delivery mechanism for them arriving at this consciousness understanding and non-duality, right? And But there are numerous other circles, channeling circles like you talked about that I'm aware of that are not connected to ufology, who also are seeing this burgeoning awakening where people are remembering this context that subsumes this one. So to me, I do feel like as much as I understand historically, it seems a bit presumptuous to say it's all going down in our lifetime. But I think there's some evidence to support that in the data themselves, even though I agree that's open to interpretation. I just don't think it's... I think you'd have a hard time supporting that, you know? And I think it's like when you look at natural disasters, you know, and you look at the tsunami in Indonesia, you know, what, 20 years ago, that was, that was the apocalypse for them. If you lived in Asheville, North Carolina, a few months ago, that was, you're in North Carolina. I mean, that was their apocalypse for families there. Their life will never be the same. Their life will fall apart, be destroyed. And they'll talk about, you know, how they're, dad committed suicide because he couldn't do this and this and that, and the, their whole life will change. So it's wherever we want to put the lens. And you saw the video, the guy from Australia, he's going up to New Guinea and he's going to try and, you know, make contact with the tribe and you know, the headhunters or whatever, you know, the native people threw spears at him, killed him and stuff like that. We tend to think in a very ethnocentric way. And the counter evidence that the counter data that I keep presenting that, again, I... You're fantastic. I really appreciate you engaging in this dialogue, but I don't think you fully engage with it, is that there is some push towards a one world government. And we don't know if it's an exopolitical, but it's clearly a push. So I would decouple the notion of us having to move towards some sort of collective working together from the globalist agenda you're talking about. So I'm open to the possibility. As I said, I'm very open to seeing data. I don't dismiss it out of hand at all. And I have even entertained the notion that because I have seen in the data themselves suggestions that human thriving has been going down over time, which shouldn't be the case, which seems to perhaps suggest some sort of 
deep cabal who is actually slowly trying to rob humans of their agency, help them forget who they are by distracting them so that they don't act out of their own inherent power, which is connected to this undercurrent of connected energy. So I'm open to saying that's the case, while also saying that I do think that just because of the nature of the fact that everything is interconnected, that's the fundamental nature of reality, that we will have to find ways to work together and not be in opposition to each other, that there are real implications to the illusion of separation that I think we can and should overcome and we'll have a better world for it without saying, therefore, that I want these particular guys and their particular agenda to be the manifestation of that. How does that not lead to Star Wars? Lead to Star Wars? Is that what you said? Yeah, essentially. I mean, that's what Bruce Fenton is talking about. That's what John Brandenburg is saying, that this is our history. Our history is advancement, but it still is two sides that don't agree, and it's Star Wars. So I, because I'm, a, uh, I'm into non-duality, I just this two sides thing, this, uh, this binary view just doesn't play well for me. You just described a binary. You just described, hey, you know, are people becoming addicted to the phones and the dopamine and all the rest of that? I mean, that's in this reality. And you're making real points about that. Fair Human enough. But I'm, I think they're misguided. I think they're misguided. I think I don't think it's necessarily that they are pure evil. I think that they are misguided about who we ultimately are, what we ultimately are, and what our potential is. If you really buy into the physicalist agenda and many academics just uh, inherit it as part of our culture, and without questioning it, as a lot of business people do, then you're going to say, well, the best we can do is give people more technology, maybe help them overcome diseases by integrating with machines. But that's not necessarily because there's this agenda of ultimate evil. I think that while the illusion of separation plays out, people will try to dominate. They will try to suppress people. They will try to hoard resources. Like All of these arise from the illusion of separation, which is not to say that there are not parasitic entities. There are not some dark fields of energy that seem to prey on and thrive on other beings suffering. I think there are. But again, I would just argue for a spectrum rather than this binary view. And again, I would argue that we do need to be careful of all the things you're saying. And I think part of what is missing in our conversation is it tends to be, are you here? And I'm saying there's truth in both elements. It's more complicated. It's multidimensional. Let's look at the data. Let's all be open to this and recognize on the one hand that we do need to overcome this, perhaps this group that might be non-human as well as human in some sort of accord that is basically trying to control people, rob them of their agency, um, not give into that and the ruse that they're calling this you know, happy collective, but at the same time recognize that we do need to move to some sort of sense of um, collective cooperation to overcome some of the challenges we face and to fully step into our birthright as beings that are part of this interconnected field. So for me, I want to have a richer, deeper dialogue and be open to some of what you're saying, but also not reduce that to this kind of binary view, which I'm not saying you're doing, but some people do. So Darren, uh, excellent, excellent. I so appreciate it. Tell folks about Point of Convergence podcast and Essence of Being training. Sounds fantastic. And then you have another podcast as well. You actually have three podcasts. So um, the first podcast that I began is Point of Convergence, which we've already discussed, is basically discussing the overlap, the intersection of all of these um, anomalous fields of research that seem to be pointing to something fundamental about reality that you and I tend to agree on. Liminal Frames is a second podcast, which I do with my friend Nathan. We both have a religious studies background, so we sort of connect not just the modern UFO phenomenon and NDEs, but also bring in religious history and how that might be part of the same dance between these <clears throat> cosmic uh, beings and intelligences. And then Event Horizons, the third podcast I have where with my co-host Janice, we entertain the passage we were all going through right now as a collective and how that involves both challenges and opportunities, like what we talked about with AI, where it could be, you know, it could be work out really well for us, or it could be used uh, to our detriment, depending on who's controlling it. And the essence of being came out of my experiences, basically. Um, so it's both both based on my experiences and also my understanding of non-duality and my, uh, my conviction that this interconnected field um, is not ultimately a better description of who we are, but that there's immense uh, wealth of information and intelligence there for us to tap into if we can transcend this sense of being separate beings and separate objects. So it's a very pragmatic way of through things like guided meditation, helping people tap in to somatic knowledge and noetic understanding that 
transcends sort of the cerebral process, and then some actual just curriculum to help us um, work through how we could move towards some of the collaboration I was talking about earlier. Well, that's really awesome. And you're obviously bringing light into the world and all about that. And your energy is fantastic. And I love the deep thinking that goes into your shows is super impressive. So I hope people do check them out. And I'm very grateful for you joining me today. I appreciate it. Well, I've fully enjoyed it too, Alex. I'm glad for the pushback. And uh, we need to have these conversations and be willing to entertain you know, all of the data, not just the ones we prefer. So I look forward to doing it again sometime. You bet. We will. 